Hey, welcome to Hackerverse Reverse Engineering Sessions. I'm John. Thanks for joining me. Today we're going to be doing another Crack Me Challenge. The one I'm going to be looking for is a uh, pretty basic reverse engineering challenge. Again, x86-64 Linux. Uh, this one ends up being a kind of interesting one where the input doesn't always work. It works based on time. So you see this kind of work here. When I run it, it asks me for a password. I type that in, and it just tells me incorrect password. Uh, this is sort of like the, the heart of the problem here. It's the main function where we have a couple of things going on. You'll notice the local time at top, the uh, initial time to get a time t, and then that gets passed to local time for formatting. And... Uh, Turns out that local time ends up getting checked and used as a part of an algorithm to determine if the user input is correct or not. Right. That value up there on line 13 and 14, local 38, uh, starting there is the, uh, I don't know, whatever the user prompt is when you type in a, a username. They use this, this type of string obfuscation here where you're having those bytes, um, those green bytes there. Uh, on the stack that are set up and it goes through and decodes them uh, at some point here you'll see me kind of go back and take a look at the length of incorrect password and verify that it's the length of the the data down the bottom this is the algorithm or back there was the algorithm that checks your input we'll take a look at it more closely here in a little bit yeah so if i run this just with some junk input incorrect password here is I believe this is 19 characters. Yep. And if you look here, we have 8, 8, and 3. Um, so that's 19 characters. Uh, that's going to be our incorrect password once it gets run through that for loop and printed out. Um, I don't need to prove that to myself. I'm pretty sure that's exactly what happened. So I just kind of make the assumption that that is correct and uh, move on. This one, I, I kind of keep coming back and renaming that function a little bit. It's essentially taking the string length of the user input and uh, if it's exactly equal to 15, um, it will return zero. We need it to be zero to move down to the success message. So there's a couple of things that need to happen here. And uh, that's pretty much it. So inside of that ret zero, or that uh, return function is where we're going to go. You know, it's really hard to document those things and make them nice and clean and understandable, at least for me. Like when I draw things out on paper, I'm like spatial. So I like to have things kind of drawn off with boxes around them and lines between different notes. And, you know, it's, it's easier for me to organize it this way. So I just copy that function, brought it out here, and uh, I'm going to line up all of the bytes that are being modified in this buffer, the param1 buffer, which is basically just the user input. And then um, we're going to go through and see how to satisfy all of the checks. This one is very doable from um, you know, like a manual standpoint. If there were hundreds of these things, if the input was really large, uh, that's probably where I would try to uh, bring the stuff in and do some auto formatting with Sublime like macros and stuff to, to set it up real nice and then just maybe pass it to um, uh, something like Microsoft Z3 and just have it solve. Uh, you could also use Anger to collect the constraints yourself, but when it's like this, you can pretty much easily collect the constraints yourself without having to do symbolic execution. So while we're going through this, we can see param9, actually param1 ninth offset, which is actually the 10th character, um, will essentially just be an F. As long as that equals F, it's gonna continue and satisfy that. And we're gonna to have to keep going down through all of the things here. The one without the index, param zero, that star uh, print zero, is gonna be the uh, first index or index zero. Um, here, I'm just <laughs> verifying to myself that that, uh, that uh, and right there isn't necessarily needed. So I'm gonna go through and I think delete those at one point just to make it a little less um, Mm, complex, I guess. So while we're going through this in the uh, 
first reverse engineering session I had mentioned at the beginning that, uh, you know, the more you do reverse engineering, the less reverse engineering you do. And I had intended to explain that a little bit more. Uh, it turns out that, uh, you know, the more you do this professionally, the more you kind of uh, take on different roles and wear different hats. Um, it turns out the people who are newish to maybe like mid career tend to do a lot of the bulk technical work. And uh, once you get into the, the higher sort of, I guess, levels of experience, you've seen so many different things, you've seen so many challenges, you've overcome so many different things that uh, you get pretty good at understanding where the pitfalls are going to be and where the hurdles might be in a large reverse engineering project or vulnerability research project that you start to be put into roles that allow you to sort of uh, task other people and make sure that the project is successful. You're writing white papers, you're writing proposals, you're dealing with clients and making sure that they're happy, you're uh, trying to use people to the best of their um, experience. So we'll have people who are naturally better at certain areas or more interested in those. And we try to um, you know, build them up and develop them in the areas that they want to be better at, but also try to use their talents um, you know, the best that we can to succeed. And being put into that role means that you take a le- more of a backseat role in the actual technical work, but uh, you start to steer the ship a little bit more. So it's odd, but uh, the more you do this, the less uh, technical work you have to do. So um, interesting, but I, I like to, every once in a while, just sit down and do some challenge problems or some reverse engineering just uh, to kind of, you know, just keep doing it, right? Um, we have so many talented reverse engineers that if I were going to sit down and do that to actually compete with them, I feel like at this point I'm starting to get uh, – slower at the process than than they are so if anything i've got them on a little bit of the experience and in understanding what our customers need and what means mission success and all that stuff so kind of stay on that role so we're still doing this uh there is no doubt that this this particular process is uh slow and i could probably speed this up maybe by doing anger again maybe by passing this to uh the smt solver um there's a lot of different ways to solve this, but I just wanted to kind of tackle this by hand. It's not too bad. I think maybe if this were more than 32 characters, maybe 64 or something is probably my breaking point where I would abandon this um, process here and, and try to format this for Z3. Uh, or perhaps use symbolic execution to get those constraints for me and pass it in. Uh, you know, using something like anger. So I expected that to work. It didn't. So now I'm trying to just print out the date, uh, the date time here. And I'm looking for any of these ones to show correct, but I'm just getting incorrect passwords. So I think I'm just not sure. There we go. That worked. I might've just had something messed up with my formatting or had an extra character in there or something. So what you'll see is you'll see a correct password at 21, and then you'll see one at 27. Why does one and seven work? Well, we'll kind of show that here in a second. So you have that local time mod 10, then mod three, and then that has to be either zero, one, or two. I went with the assumption that it would always be one, but when you take something like 27 mod 10 mod three, it is one. So that results in BVAR, uh, what was it? BVAR one equaling one, right? So it's the same in a couple of different cases. Um, as long as you hit that exact time, it'll work. Uh, you can sort of evaluate the other ones and then pass those in. But uh, that's the way I decided to do it. Until next time.